one of these days before the season is over, I'm going to figure out where the button is on that microphone. So anyway, are you fully confused? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought it was already on. Okay, I'm. <coughs> that's mistake number number two. I turned it on. Now I'm on. Yeah. Okay. We're very professional minded around here. Our minds are professional. It's just the rest of us doesn't doesn't follow through. So anyway. Well, I hope that uh, you didn't get too confused on this passage of Scripture uh, because it deals into some pretty heavy theology, some pretty heavy doctrinal truths. But the thing that we want to look at today as we examine this passage of Scripture is this whole idea of grace. I don't know if you thought about it before, but... uh, Most of us have a misunderstanding of what the definition of grace is. Now, when I was in seminary and growing up in a pastor's home, I understood that the literal definition of grace was God's unmerited favor. And uh, that's kind of what I thought about. And even through seminary days, uh, that was my understanding. And quite uh, quite, quite honestly, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I had experienced God's grace. I committed my life to Christ when I was just a small boy. But when I thought of grace and I thought of those two words, God, well, three words, God's unmerited favor, I knew, first of all, that this was something that God did. It wasn't something I did. And then the word unmerited obviously means undeserved. You, couldn't, you can't earn it. There's nothing that you and I can do to get God's favor. But that word favor kind of hung kind of, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, stopped me in my tracks. Because when somebody would say to me, will you do me a favor? Then that was my idea of how God was working with us, was God will do me a favor. Whenever I need something, God's going to do me a favor. Sure, yeah, hang on a second, I'm going to finish making that star, and then I'll come and do whatever you need done. And... um, I remember years ago when I was in seminary, there was a very, very well-known pastor in Florida whose name was Jess Moody, and he pastored a very large church in Fort Lauderdale, and he wrote a book entitled, Grace is Not a Blue-Eyed Blonde, and uh, that sort of caught my attention, but I still didn't know anything much more about what God's grace was all about until, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, something like that. It had to be more than 25 years ago. Uh, I had a, we had a pastor in a conference begin to explain to us what God's grace literally means. Now, the word grace comes from the word charis in the, in the Greek language, uh, which means gift. It's a free gift. It's something that you receive. You see, if, if you, well, for example, in your salvation and also in all of your Christian life, if you, if you receive God's blessing based on your performance, it's not a gift. It's a reward. And if you receive God's blessing because of how hard you work at being a Christian, doing a lot of different things, it's not a gift. It's a salary. It's a paycheck. God says that he offers us everything. Peter talked about it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He said he has given us these great and precious promises that by them we might be partakers of his divine nature. So think about this. Everything that you have ever received from God was an act of His grace. He didn't do it because you were good. He didn't do it because you deserved it. He didn't do it because you went to church or gave your tithes or taught a Sunday school class or read scripture or preached a sermon. He did it and He continues to do it exclusively because of His grace. 
So grace is much more than that blue-eyed blonde, and it is much more than God's unmerited favor. The word for grace appears 131 times in the Bible. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans refers and uses that word more than any other single writer in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And I've tried to put together from what somebody else had described as grace, what I think is a good definition, and this definition is in the study guide that you can look at when you get home, but I want you to listen to this. Grace, because, and let me back up and say that this scripture that that Mark read at the very end, the very final passage out of 2 Corinthians, I want you to get this. If, if you don't get anything else from what I say today, get this. God is able to make all grace, all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now think about those words. I mean, the the, the word all, God gives all grace, not just part of it. God just doesn't, he doesn't hold back part of his grace from you. He gives you all the grace you need. You remember the story in 2 Corinthians where Paul describes the times that he prayed to God to take away the thorn in the flesh that he had? A lot of people think that that was his eyesight, that he was losing his his vision. But whatever it is, Paul asks God on three different occasions, God, can you just take this away from me? And God didn't say, okay. What he said was, hang on, Paul. My grace is sufficient. So what was it that God gave grace, gave to Paul out of his grace? It wasn't salvation because Paul has already had committed his life to Christ on the road to Damascus decades earlier. You see, and so you can't look at grace as just being your salvation experience. We're saved by grace through faith. This is what Paul said in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith. But it's more than just salvation. It's just more than our being our sins. If that was enough, if, if all that God gave us was forgiveness of our sins and a fire insurance policy from hell and eternal life in heaven someday, that would be worth it. But there's more to it than that because God is offering us all of his grace that will overflow to you so that you will have all sufficiency. You will have everything that you need in every situation you face so that you will have an overflow of God's grace for every good deed that you carry out. Now, here's a way that he described it to the Philippian Christians. He said in Philippians 2.6, It is God who is work at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. He also said in Philippians 1.6, He who began this good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ. So what is this thing we're talking about then? What is this grace? Well, here's the definition that I put down. And and again, this is in the study guide that you can look at when you get home. Grace is the act of God providing you everything that you need, which you don't have and can't produce and don't deserve, and to be everything he wants you to be, which you can't possibly be, and do everything he wants you to do, which you can never accomplish and become everything he intends you to become, which can, you can never become yourself. Now, does that leave anything uncovered? <clears throat> Folks, here's what I... This is, this is what's been burning in my heart for the last couple of weeks. As we go through life and have life's experiences and get older and then we begin to face our own mortality... We need to come back to understand that it is, as, as uh, 
one of, one of the ancient writers, I just, John Calvin said, and also Charles Spurgeon, it is all of grace. He has a book by that title, All of Grace. You can't go back to anything that you did. You can't go back to your heritage. You can't go back to your upbringing. You can't go back to how well you pray or how often you pray. You can't go back to how many times you've read the Bible through. You can't go back to your baptism. You can't go back to your church membership. You can't go back to your giving. You can't go back to anything except God's expression of love to you through His grace. Now, God's love is unconditional. I want you to think about this. God's love is unconditional. How does God release that love? He releases it releases it through his compassion because love that is not expressed isn't love it's just a vague concept but God loves us to the point that he has compassion on us now what does compassion do compassion drives you to action if you see somebody you can have pity on them or you can feel sorry for them but it will not cause you to take action. But if you have compassion on them, I guarantee you, you do something. And so when God's love is enacted by his compassion, he expresses his love in two ways, through his grace and through his mercy. We've talked about this before here. God's grace is when he gives you what you don't deserve in order to meet your needs and to enrich you spiritually. God's mercy, on the other hand, is when he withholds from us what we do deserve, you see. And so that's the way God expresses his love. Because of his compassion, he pours out his grace on us and gives us whatever we need to live in this life and to prepare us for heaven. At, he then also extends his mercy, because Paul talks about this in the text that Mark read, that God proved his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. It was the mercy of God that put Christ on the cross to die the death that he didn't deserve for sins that he never committed so that you and I could receive by his grace something that we could never ever receive no matter how hard we tried. Does that make sense? And so this is what, we, what I, I want you to understand. And this is so many of the different scriptures. Because God's grace is the unconditional of expression of his love. It is also the um, unbelievable, my, mind, my eyes are a little blurry here, unbelievable enactment, enactment of our transformation. Paul, again to the Roman Christians, if you had to put, just keep one book out of the whole Bible, I would suggest Romans, because you have the totality of the salvation principle found from man's sin all the way up to God's justification, forgiveness, and making us just as if we'd never sinned. Scripture Mark started with, therefore being justified, by faith, being made just as if we'd never sinned, by faith we have peace with God. God's no longer our enemy. And then he goes on and he talks about this. And in the 6th chapter, in the 7th and 8th chapter, Paul goes into great detail in Romans about how the fact that there's nothing good within us, but yet there is that ability by which God has enabled us not only to be forgiven of sin, but also to overcome and to be able to have victory in our lives. And so we have this unbelievable enactment of, of our transformation because in the 12th chapter of Romans, then Paul makes this statement in verse 1. He says, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice that is wholly acceptable to be God, which is your reasonable expression of worship. But then in verse 2 he says this, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove and demonstrate what God's will is for you. And so this expression of God's grace is not only that he expresses his love to us through the, his grace, but also he enacts to us that ability that by the Holy Spirit and through God's word, our lives can be transformed. And our minds, when our minds are changed, our actions follow, you see. So when, I, when, for example, when we are convinced that lying is a sin, that lying is not to be a part of the life of the believer, then we will stop lying. But until that happens, we still will have that propensity to twist the truth, to stretch the truth, to deny the truth, or to just outright ignore the truth and just outright lie. And that can be said about any human characteristic. And then you have God's grace as being the undeniable exhibition of the Holy Spirit's power because you and I can't do. I mean, I'll be real honest with you. I can't, I can't live up to the standards that God, God has for me. I've been a Christian. Wow. Scares me. I've been a Christian for 77 years. And after all those years, having been raised in a pastor's home and been in ministry since 1956, I cannot, I can't, I can't meet the standard. And, and I have a pretty good idea, you probably can't either. But it's the grace of God. It's the fact that God is going to give you whatever it is you need for the moment. You see, this is why when Paul made that statement and said, God, could you take this thorn away from me? And God said, my grace is sufficient. Now, what, what do you think? Just think about this. If, indeed, Paul was losing his eyesight, and the fact that he refers to it and says, see what great letters I'm writing this letter to you, and then he started using men like Titus and Timothy and some of the others, and Luke to go and Barnabas to go with him as his scribe, and you see that, it sounds pretty likely that that may have been the thorn in the flesh. But what if God, I mean, we can only speculate. What if God had taken away that thorn early in Paul's life and he ended up with perfect eyesight? What would that have done? Would it have changed in any way the letters that we have from him? See, Paul wrote more letters more of the books of the New Testament than any other writer. I think 13, if I remember correctly. Think about what it would be like if Paul, well, for well, not just, just use a hypothetical illustration. Let's say that you're Titus. And Paul says, Titus, take this down. And Paul starts going on and on in one of his ever, ever never-ending sentences filled with clause after clause after clause after clause and twists you. And Titus says, Hang on a minute. I can't write that fast. And if Paul had done all that writing by himself, you know, imagine how much bigger the New Testament would have been. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It was the fact that God gave Paul grace to endure that affliction that enabled him to be the man that he was, to understand suffering, to understand hardship. It enabled him maybe to, if it was eyesight that was his problem, maybe he didn't see some things happen that he, if he'd had better eyesight, he'd have seen it and it would have made him mad and he'd have taken some other course of action. That's all hypothetical, obviously. But what I want to, uh, I hope you understand is this. Nothing Nothing ever happens in your life without going through God's hand and without receiving God's grace. Whatever it is, it can be a tragedy, it can be a financial collapse, it can be a job loss, it can be a health issue, it can be a thousand different things. But for every event in your life, Every moment in your life, God is releasing his grace on you.
and he may release it in the form of peace if you're going through a time of anxiety. He may release it with a, in the form of a spirit of humility if you are becoming proud and arrogant about something or you're becoming to boast. He may release it to you in the form of forgiveness if you find yourself being critical of other people and judging other people. He may release it in the form of hope if your discouragement and depression is getting the best of you. He may release it to you in the form of knowledge or wisdom if you find yourself facing a decision or a situation that you can't seem to figure out. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is, it's not that God's grace is only salvation, which it is salvation, but God's grace includes everything that you need. Patience, long-suffering, forgiveness, humility, righteous indignation when you need it, a courage and boldness, a willingness to take a risk and step out in faith with something that God's calling you to. And so whatever else we get from today, the thing I hope that you will understand is that God is here with you and in you through the work of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to release heartbeat by heartbeat every expression of his provision that he has. And in the days in which you and I live, I don't know of anything that is needed more than this encouragement, but particularly for Christians. Because if you haven't noticed lately, it looks like not only has our whole country fallen apart, but our world is on the verge of teetering into oblivion, it seems. Now, we know that's not really going to happen, but how do you deal? How do you deal with your attitude concerning political issues? How do you deal with your emotions concerning relationships that you have that are being fractured because you don't agree on something? How do you deal with, 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 with patience and hope and, uh, when, when all of a sudden the future looks so bleak that you just want to give up and quit in despair? How do you handle that? How do you wake up in the morning where instead of saying, good morning, Lord, you say, good Lord, morning? You see, How do you... Well, I'm just... I'm not doing a very good job of explaining what's in my heart today for you. But my hope is this, that we will be able, as some of the scriptures that I've listed here, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because they'll be filled. What is it that generates that spiritual hunger inside you? Where you want to be more than you are, where you long to be in the presence of God. It is basically God's way of getting your attention so that you will call out to him for what he needs and when you hunger and thirst for his righteousness, what's the promise? You'll be filled. Or Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when that happens, then all these things will be added to you according to his purpose and his plan. Or you could look at Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like spiritually you're caught up or even emotionally you're caught up in the middle of a desert? Well, if you live in the Yuma like we do, you understand that. <laughs> so there are so many different scriptures that you could look at. But I just have to tell you this. God's grace was delivered to us through his son. In John chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, listen to this. <clears throat> 
the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory the glory as of the only begotten from the father full of what full of grace and truth when Christ was born became flesh he was the embodiment of the totality of God's grace one of the scriptures that Mark read a little earlier in Romans 5:10 for while if if while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And then in John 1, 16, of his fullness, we've all received, and I love this little phrase, and grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, you get the message? He giveth more grace. One of the songs that I was really tempted to shock you with by singing it this morning was one that my dad and I used to sing all the time, He Giveth More Grace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, and then it goes on and he says, God just pours out his grace upon us. I remember George Beverly Shea used to sing that song before he passed away. His love has no limit. You know, I mean, I could just go on and talk about that. But we need to go finish. Because this, this grace that he gives us begins at our salvation. Actually, prior to our salvation, because his grace is so large. It says in John 3.16, you know this, where God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. So before you and I were ever alive, 2,000 years earlier, God already expressed his grace to us, anticipating our coming by sending his son to die for us. And when he did, then the Holy Spirit at that particular point in our lives begins to work in our hearts and convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. Paul talks about this. He says that and to his disciples in John 16, I think it is, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. I used to wonder what all that's talking about, but then I realized he will convict the world of man's sin. He will convict the world of Christ's righteousness, and he will convict the world of God's judgment. You see, that's what draws us to salvation. When we realize that we're sinners and we realize that Christ has paid the price for us and when we realize that if we do not turn to Christ, we will have to face our own judgment for our own sin and pay the price ourselves, which is eternal separation from God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so when that comes in our lives, it draws us to that point where we commit our lives to Christ and we repent of our sin and we accept his forgiveness and we receive the eternal life. And I, not only forgiveness, but cleansing. I love 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, the word confess means to agree with, to say the same thing. Con means with. If we agree with God about our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but he doesn't end there and he says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, he takes away the power of sin and the penalty of sin, but he also takes away the evidence of what we used to be like and removes the stain. No wonder when God looks at us, he sees us as righteous because we are robed and clothed in the righteousness of his son. Well, we need to quit. You're not listening nearly quickly enough. So this life that he gives us as an expression of his grace begins at our salvation, takes us through all of the challenges of life. Not a single event that you have ever gone through or that you will go through in the future will you ha ha go through a part from the presence of God's grace. 
His grace, again, is whatever it is that you need. If, his, if you need joy, he'll provide it. If you need a quiet heart, he'll provide it. If you need understanding, he'll provide it. The book of Proverbs says, if any, uh, uh, you know, he talks about seeking after wisdom. And then James makes this comment to the church in Jerusalem. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, because God never shortchanges you. Now that's my translation. So whatever it is that you need for now, but it doesn't, his grace doesn't end there. It continues on right up until the time and during the time that we spend an eternity in Christ's presence in heaven. Grace is a forever thing. So when you go through a hard time, when you go through times of doubt, when you go through times of uncertainty, or even anger and being upset with something, re, re, draw on the grace of God. Draw on it. It's a well. It is a wealth of, of, of resources. So instead, for example, do you ever say, Lord, give me patience? How about you just accept it? Somebody said, and I said this years ago, Instead of Lord asking the Lord, give me patience, say, Lord, be my patience. Because whatever it is that you need, he is. And so when we come to the end of all this, and the writer of Hebrews makes this amazing statement, and, and it says this, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. And that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So don't come short of God's grace. And in 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. In other words, don't just walk out of here today saying, Oh, that was a nice sermon. Walk out of here saying, I'm a grace receiver. I'm going to do it now. Not when I'm older, not when this problem is solved, but now. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, I think I've said enough. I hope that you have a better understanding of what God's grace is. It's not that blue-eyed blonde. It's not God's unmerited favor. But John Newton really said it best. I don't know if you'd ever thought about this. I was reminded of this story when I saw a video uh, on um, Facebook uh, of a, uh, an old, old, old Gaither homecoming video where this African-American brilliant soloist named Whitley Phipps, I don't know if any have heard or not, he got a deep, rich bass voice. And he told us the story. He said, uh, did you know that every spiritual is written on the five black notes of the keyboard? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Deep River, all of these spirituals were all written on what they call the pentatonic scale. Pentatonic means five notes. And they're all the black notes. You go back to, if you have a piano or something, go back and try to remember some of those spirituals and see if you can find a single one that is not written on the pentatonic scale. That was, the, that was the musical scale of the slave, the American slave, actually, and the African slave before that. And he said, many years ago, there was a man who wrote what we call the white spiritual. His name was John Newton. And he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. And you go back to the piano, and you can play that whole song on those five black notes. What sometimes people don't know 
and Phipps made this observation was it is highly probable that John Newton heard that tune because the tune, the author of the tune is unknown. We know the who wrote the words to Amazing Grace, it was John Newton. So Phipps' assumption is this, John Newton before he became a Christian was the captain of a slave ship who brought slaves from Africa to England, to the Caribbean, and to North America. And there were more times than one where Newton, because of a storm, would have to take and throw many of those slaves overboard, manacled together with chains, and see them all drown, 10 or 15 or 20 at a time, in order to rescue his ship. So when John Newton wrote his hymn, it was put to the tune of that tune he had heard coming up from the belly of his slave ships. Amazing grace, <laughs> how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 